Okay. <clears throat> Hi, so I'm uh, Chris Richardson from BP Institute in Cambridge, and I'm just going to talk a little bit about uh, some of the experiences I've had uh, on HPC systems. And um, I should mention that I, I've, sort of be, I've been a developer with on, on Dolphin for the last few years, um, mostly working with Garth Wells. And I'm not really going to have any maths in my talk, so I hope this is going to be sort of fairly entertaining and lightweight, and um, you know, you'll be able to just enjoy and not, uh, not, uh, not take it too seriously. And please, you know, ask me any questions as I'm going along and heckle whatever. I, I think it's the best way to do it. Um, okay, so quick overview. Tour some of the HPC systems that I've been using. A couple of user problems that I've uh, been helping people with and supporting. Um, scaling. When people are using HPC systems, they always want to talk about how well it scales. And uh, it can be a bit confusing, but I'll hopefully um, I'll make some sense of that. A little bit about using Python. And then last time I talked uh, at the uh, Phoenix uh, workshop was in 2013. And I had some very sketchy ideas about, um, uh, about mesh refinement, which uh, I think Doug Arnold inter interrupted at the end and said, uh, well, there's no, nothing new about that. So I thought, well, OK, I'll make sure I put something new in this time and actually have some, uh, some, something interesting to say. And uh, time for questions and coffee afterwards. So there we go. So this is uh, yeah, the Cambridge. Uh, HPC system, circa, 1940, circa 1946. It's like, um, well, it's, what is it? It's a room full of light bulbs, basically. That's, uh, that's Morris Wilkes. And uh, actually, I was thinking this, this could be like a caption competition for the, for the, for the meeting. If anyone's got a good, good caption for this, he looks pretty pleased with himself. Uh, and more or less, I mean, you know, people, some people say this is like the first computer. But actually, it was the first sort of computer service that, uh, as a scientist, you could, um, you could ask for time on this computer, um, the, the programmers would write your program for you, help you, you to write your program, and then uh, it would be submitted in a, literally in a queue, it would be punched onto paper tape and clipped onto a, a board, the job would be run, and then you'd get your output on a, a printout. So it was really very similar to the HPC systems that we have today. So, um, yeah, 650 instructions per second it could manage, so, um, you know. Sorry? Okay, <laughs> and um, yeah, that you use about 12, 12 kilowatts for 3,000 3, valves. So, um, oops, wrong way. This is what we've got in Cambridge now. This is our sort of uh, update. This is uh, provided by Dell, and you can see they've changed the way that it looks. Um, instead of a sort of a room full of light bulbs, we've now got a room full of fridges. Um, it's named after Charles Darwin, so that's got like 10,000 cores. And it's a pretty decent machine. It's, it's set up really nicely for, for people to use, and um, it's really nice for doing development on because the login nodes are actually homogenous, the same, uh, same uh, layout as the, as, the, as, the, as, the, as the compute nodes. Um, okay, so yeah, I've also had a bit of access to Edison, which is the NERSC's computer. See, they actually have a picture of a little light bulbs on the front of theirs, and the inventor of the light bulb, and... Uh, this thing uses about this a Cray XC30, which uh, being installed all over the world at the moment seems to be very popular. And it uses about uh, I don't know two and a half two and a half megawatts or something, so it's like 20 tons of coal a day, something like that. <laughs> and we of course also have the UK national resource, the Archer machine, which is, is uh, it's about half the size of Edison. So I've been using these a little bit to do some uh, some work. And uh, yeah, why do you want to use HPC at all? And why bother? You could do a lot of stuff on your workstation these days, even on a laptop. And the main reason why people really want to use big machines is 3D. And the world is 3D. And if you want to do some realistic uh, physical calculations, very often you want to model in 3D, and things just go crazy. So you, you, you really need to have a big machine. Um, so a couple of people I've been working with on and off, uh, Laura Alicic, who presented at the Phoenix Workshop in 2013, uh, is modeling uh, two-phase deformation. And Dave... Bernstein, who's here today, um, has been looking at some simple equations on, on these manifold-like structures. And I've just been doing some really simple testing myself, just solving the Poisson equation on a unit cube, which is you know, very easy, but um, it's kind of a nice uh, model problem to do some scaling on. So this is what uh, Laura was doing. She was doing it, I think, when she presented two years ago in, in 2D. And uh, what it is, is there's a solid object here, a sphere, inside a test cell, which is um, under shear. So at the top, it's, shearing, it's rotating in one direction. 
in the bottom here it's rotating in the other direction. There's a kind of sort of fluid in the middle here. It's actually supposed to be a solid with intercalating fluid. And you get some kind of stress structure. And she's now been running this on Archer and uh, getting her results in 3D, which, uh, in fact, she just finished her postdoc with, with Garth and another, another lecturer in her department, and is now moving on to, to work for JPL, I think. But anyway, she's a very successful project. Uh, and this is uh, Dave's mesh. Oh, whoops, yes. Uh, yeah, oh, you maybe put this on. This is it's all uh, uh, <laughs> using any RFC. I, I don't actually know exactly what this is a mesh of. I think it's probably like a, what is it, a heat exchanger for a nuclear submarine or something. Anyway, we're not allowed to say what it is. But... Um, <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, it could be, could be. Um, right, so that's Dave's mesh, and he's been solving a simple equation on it. He said I could say whatever I liked about it, actually, but uh, anyway. So there we are. So there, yeah, because on to scaling. Scaling Scaling is always confusing because people like to plot it in different ways, and this is, um, this is one way you can do it. This is uh, basically showing how many, this is how many processes on the bottom here. This is how long it took in seconds. And this is what people would refer to as uh, a uh, strong scaling. So you say it's the same problem, and hopefully, you know, this should be a gradient of minus one. The thing's getting faster as you're running it on more cores. And inevitably, as you get to some point, you know, communication dominates and the whole thing stops working very well. So you can only really use this kind of graph to study things over a range of, like, an order of magnitude or so. Well, it depends on your problem, but anyway, you can see it works pretty well. That's, that's quite nice. Um, so, yeah, was it, I thought I'm going to do the other thing, which is weak scaling, where you take um, a, a problem, in this case it's a Poisson problem. Now, so, some of you have probably seen this before, I've presented this before, and this is actually on, on Figshare. Um, you can find this on the, on the web. Um, so, you, 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 you basically set the problem size on, on, one, on one process, and then as you go up in, in um, number process count, you increase the problem size. So, the, the load per core is always the same. And you can see here we've, we've going from, sort of 20, from 24 processes to 24,000 processes, and the time that it takes is really, well, I, I'm not going to say it's constant, but it's not bad. It's broken down into different sections here. Mesh creation um, solves, that's PETC, here, PETC um, GMG with uh, CG. Assembly time and doth map creation. And then the total wall time. It's a bit difficult to say what this discrepancy here between the total wall time and um, these measured bits is because it's probably something to do with loading the shared libraries. And uh, as you get to higher core counts, it can get a bit. Question. Oh, question. So the, the time yeah, I don't know. So there is something weird that happens. I mean, th this machine has got 24 cores on a node. So this is a single node. So obviously there's no communication here at all. So you, you, you'd think it should be just using shared memory here and should be fast. Yeah, so that's a good question. Okay. Yeah, okay. Yeah, okay. Well, yeah, you probably, I'd be great to talk to you afterwards, actually, and uh, can perhaps uh, I can understand some of those issues a bit more. Um, okay, another thing I, I was, so you'll probably see something similar here, actually, so something interesting here, too, which is I did exactly the same thing. I wanted to know if there was any difference between using GCC and using the Intel compilers. And Honestly, there's a lot of effort involved in getting the Intel compilers working, and it's not, it doesn't really pay off. You, so this, the lighter colors here are GCC, and the dark colors are the same with the Intel compilers. And you can see, when it, again, when it's on the one node, there's some difference here that um, the Intel compilers perform a bit better. But by the time you're going to multiple nodes, there's really not much difference. I mean, there is some systematic difference, but um, 
it's not significant enough for me to, to think that I should bother with um, using the Intel compiler. So that was uh, another conclusion. Uh, again, so this, okay, this was the 650,000 degrees of freedom per core in this case. So, um, yeah. What else? Ah, okay. This is my digression about Python. So people like to use Python for some reason. Um, <laughs> apparently, it makes things easier to, to, to write your code. And, um, of course, you do get some problems on HPC systems sometimes with Python. Um, often, sometimes, it's just simply not installed. So that's a, you know, that's a problem. Uh, one problem I had with... Uh, with Archer was that when I tried the just-in-time compiler um, on Archer with the Intel compilers, it said uh, something about uh, there's no license on the compute nodes, so that wasn't much good. Oh, anyway, so yeah, here's the, here's the timing graph, similar kind of time graph, uh, slightly, slightly different format, but basically what you're seeing now is that the total wall time and those individual times for the, each of those steps when you're running the same sort of code with Python and C++. And what you see is, of course, it's just going through the roof by the time you're getting to 10,000 cores. And one of the, one of the problems is, is that all these HPC systems use, uh, or generally use, a lossless file system, which is pretty well opt optimized for, for enormous files, uh, accessing a few big files. And when you do something like from Dolphin import star in, uh, in Python, these are the pure Python modules which you load in, so around about 1,000 modules which is fine on a laptop or workstation or even on a few tens of cores, but when you're running on a thousand cores, that's a million file accesses to the Lustre file system. And that's one reason, perhaps not the only reason, but that's one reason why uh, there's a bit of a problem. Um, and it's difficult to see immediately how to get around that. I mean, uh, Python will allow you to zip these so you could zip SymPy all up into one file, for example. So that, that's one solution which we've tried, and it does actually help a bit. So that's my little digression about Python. And now, what am I going to say? Oh, OK, a bit about, uh, so I'm sorry there's not much structure to my talk. It's all just a bit of random, random stuff. So uh, yeah, it's more scaling. Um, the other thing that I was working on three years ago was uh, implementing the HDF5 library into, into Dolphin and making that work nicely in parallel. And it, you'd hope that as you increase the number of cores, you get a nice scaling, sort of a 1 over t graph. But what you see, again, simply because of the file system limitations, is that the time tends to be sort of more or less constant. Um, so this, is, this would be called, I suppose, a, a, a strong scaling again, because I'm, uh, I'm just keeping the same size file and going to, uh, going to uh, more cores. So it's difficult to know. There are some options you can set on the file system to try and help that. But um, on the whole, I found the HDF5 library to be, to be good and really useful, but you're difficult to, to get a good scaling, a really good scaling with it. Um, but um, you know, it'd be interesting to talk to anybody who has any experience about that later on as well. Okay, so the other thing I was uh, going to talk about a little bit was parallel mesh refinement. And uh, this is, I was a bit sketchy about this uh, two years ago, but now we've got a really good uh, algorithm which works really well. And this is based on this paper by uh, Plaza and Carey from 2000. Um, so, like this. If you have a triangle, you can uh, take the longest edge and divide it. Good. If you want to split on, the, on a shorter edge, which is not the longest edge, then the rule says you must also split on the long edge and do something like that. And, of course, you can do all three. The nice thing about this algorithm is that you, you end up with a, um, a shape which uh, can actually improve the quality of your mesh. So if you have a thin uh, triangle like this, two of your new triangles are actually better shape or, or they're closer to, um, to isometric uh, shape. So... What do I mean? Equilateral. Okay, that's in 2D. You can pretty easily extend this to 3D because, after all, if we just have tetrahedral meshes, the faces of the mesh just are triangles. So if we just do this on all the triangles of a tetrahedral mesh and somehow cleverly join up the inside to make tetrahedra, then um, we can do the same thing. So that's what you get if you split up a tetrahedron and it all works really nicely. Okay, so that's fine, and we can do that in parallel. It's very easy to, to um, transmit the information on the edges between processes, and that all works. Oh, yeah, okay, so scaling. Uh, again, weak scaling, so I've just put more, um, more cells as I've got to more processes, and we see that the time that it takes to refine, um, let's see how, okay, up to, in this case, about the maximum one was about, um, I don't know, a few, few billion there. It's pretty constant. It's taking about four or five seconds to do that. 
Um, not too bad. And then you start to think, well, actually, this mesh um, refinement thing, it's a kind of topological operation, really. It doesn't really care about the geometry. So we, we can do some other th clever things. Supposing we wanted to do one of these cut mesh methods, um, like uh, August was talking about and uh, like Suzanne has been doing. Um, you don't have to use the longest edge. You can cheat. You can use a different edge. You can be asymmetric. We don't have to, to bisect in the middle. We can bisect wherever we like. And we could say, let's say this is the longest edge, because I want to do a cut here. So even though this is, is actually the longest edge, we'll, we'll do that. So you can make a cut anywhere you like through these triangles. Um, and it allows you, in 3D, to take something like a cube with some kind of random uh, cells on it and put a plane through it or put a surface through it and divide it into two halves very nicely um, like that. So I'm pretty pleased with that. That's, um, that's, that's pretty much wh where I've got to. Um, and thank you for your attention. Sorry for the uh, somewhat uh, incoherent and uh, not, not necessarily, there's not really a story there, is there? But uh, anyway, I'm sure there'll be plenty of questions. Yeah, I know. I mean, the, there is an issue which I, mean, I, I, I received some feedback from uh, the help desk on Archer about a, a craze solution to this problem using. Um, dynamic library caching. I don't know if you've seen this, DLFM. Yes, but, but I guess my point was that I think we as a community, pretty much Cray or no one else is really going to implement the Yeah, exactly. So the 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 cray, the, 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 the cray dynamic library caching it relies on being able to cache. So yeah, exactly. It's, it doesn't help particularly. Zip, so zipping Python with a special version, then you can get better performance. Maybe I mean there are, there are various solutions. As Jarab was saying, there's various solutions out there for for ad hoc solutions to it. I mean one one idea is you just read in your libraries on one one process and then use MPI to to send them out. And you can do that. Um, the problem is is that Python won't let you load shared objects like that. Yeah. You can only load pure Python like that. So it works for the pure Python, but for the shared objects, you still have the yeah. same problem. And as, as David was saying, sometimes your shared objects might be changing, and so you can't cache them.